Good morning, everyone. Welcome you all for the webinar on the topic of wind engineering for long span bridges organized by Indian Association of Structural Engineers. The webinar is going to be discussing on the topic of wind related issues and everything related to wind loading on long span bridges. And first of all, I would like to welcome Mr. Alok Bomik, who is going to be the moderator for the session. Mr. Alok Bomik is the managing director of BNS Engineering Consultants, which is a well known uh, consultancy in the field of bridge engineering. Mr. Alok is an active member of several professional associations and code committees, and he has been contributing immensely in the field of bridge engineering. He has written over 50 technical papers in Indian as well as international journals. And currently, he is the Honorary Secretary of Indian Association of Structural Engineers, Vice Chairman of Indian National Group of IABSC, Chairman Editorial Board of Quarterly Journal published by ING IABSC, and Governing Council Member of CEAI. I welcome Mr. Alok Bumik to take the section. Uh, I think there is some issue with uh, his internet connection. He just kind of, I think he'll be joining back. Yep. Hello. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I think there was some disconnection. It's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so can we start now? Already we started. I think uh, uh, Mr. Rahul already introduced both of you, so please go ahead. Okay, so it is now my chance to welcome you all. So Good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, IA Structive webinar. Uh, I think uh, you all, many of you are aware that in the last webinar of IA Structive, which was uh, held, uh, you know, last Sunday, 26th of July, I think, Dr. Uh, Lakshmi Parmeshwaran was the speaker and we had a test of uh, wind engineering that day when she covered the topic of wind engineering for short and medium span bridges. Today, uh, we are going to cover the topic of wind engineering for long span bridges. And uh, when we uh, talk about the long span bridges, actually we are talking about, you know, uh, various type of cable supported bridges and uh, maybe long span cantilever type of bridges, bridges having spans uh, more than 150 meter or so. Uh, when we talk about wind engineering on long span bridges, you know, this is a pretty vast subject and it involves uh, stakeable dynamics. It involves uh, dynamics of the superstructure deck. It involves the tower dynamics. And uh, if we want to cover all these subjects in entirety, one or two webinars are not sufficient. We need many more. 
so today uh, we are going to cover only a part of the wind engineering for long span bridges today's coverage will uh, sort of include the wind climate analysis the uh, topographical studies desk based stability assessments uh, sectional model wind tunnel studies i think maybe 3d buffeting analysis etc I, i leave it to our expert uh, today to speakers for that uh we hope to continue this uh, series you know in future to cover the other aspects for example the cable dynamics and the pylon dynamics also uh maybe some other time we will we will uh, sort of fix an appointment with dr suresh kumar who is our expert today for uh, further presentations on these subjects now uh, let me now introduce our speaker of the day dr suresh kumar uh we are very fortunate to have him with us today he is uh, many of you may be already aware that he is an eminent wind engineer recognized uh, all over the world for his contribution in the areas of structural response to wind uh in areas of aerodynamics in areas of wind tunnel testing uh and also in code developments he has extensive experience of working on many international projects and today he will share some of his experiences and thoughts with us dr suresh kumar has completed 20 years with the very well known firm called rwdi which is rowan williams davis and irvine inc which is a canadian based firm with branches in other places as well including india uh, i think RWDI is the world's uh, largest private wind engineering firm and Dr Suresh is spearheading this establishment of RWDI in India uh he is also i think responsible for the fifth wind tunnel at Trivandrum India where he successfully leads a team of 50 technocrats he had the privilege to work as a wind consultant on many iconic structures worldwide including the burj khalifa that is the tallest tower in dubai uh, including takoma narrows uh, suspension bridge in usa uh, he has also worked in wind engineering consultant as wind, wind engineering consultant in many indian projects uh, some of them are the 42 uh, in kolkata the statue of unity the tallest uh, statue in the world in gujarat world one tower in mumbai supernova tower in delhi tcs tower in chennai and international airport terminal to bangalore uh, and the ongoing ongoing mumbai pune missing link cable state bridge uh, dr suresh has published and presented numerous papers in international journals and conferences he is also a very active in professional bodies around the world recently dr suresh has become the vice president of rwda as a global wind engineering consultant many congratulations sir now let us come to today's topic friends uh carrying out this kind of wind studies and aerodynamic investigations are uh, you all know very highly specialized field of practice which uh, practicing bridge engineers uh, generally do not get involved with Uh, structural engineers or bridge engineers like us are generally engaged in you know uh, uh, in uh, routine affairs of you know analyzing the bridge but when it comes to uh, aerodynamic studies uh, we need specialist like dr suresh kumar for such studies and for such investigations we regular bridge engineers do not know enough to do detailed aer aerodynamic analysis and we do not really have to do these complex aerodynamic calculations ourselves in most of the situations we will have a specialist like dr suresh kumar to do this when it comes to uh, long span bridges but what is important is that we should understand enough on the subject to be able to follow what you know specialists like dr suresh kumar tells us and uh, that is really the aim of arranging this kind of lecture series uh, by ia structi on wind these lectures i think will help us all to understand the basic phenomenon what is meant by bluff deck for example what is galloping what is flutter uh, we all should have sufficient knowledge about this phenomenon 
so that we are able to understand the reports which is produced by you know such studies uh, by the wind specialists uh, we should have a full understanding of the physical phenomenon of wind and this is very important uh, of course some of you may uh, you know carry forward in your profession and become a specialist uh, yourself in wind that's a separate thing now before i hand over uh, the floor to dr suresh kumar uh, i have few housekeeping items to cover quickly firstly let me talk a bit about our association that is the indian association of structural engineers uh, uh we ias structi as you many of you know is the national apex body of structural engineers in india established in 2002 and uh, with the objective to cater to the overall professional needs of the structural engineers the association is purely a professional learned society and provides opportunity for all members to develop skills in structural engineering practice IS Trakti is engaged in organizing various CPD courses, technical lectures, refresher courses, student orientation programs, seminars, workshops, and webinars, and also panel discussions. Uh, for information of all of you, this is the twelfth webinar in series organized by IS Trakti since the uh, lockdown. The first one was organized on thirteenth of April. and uh, thereafter we have organized uh, 11 already uh, we have also organized two panel discussions on the subject uh, we are also going to organize a webinar on history of howrah bridge which is going to be uh, scheduled on 29th of august and it will be delivered by mr amitabh ghoshal an eminent personality uh, in our profession uh from next month we are organizing a 30 lecture course on cable straight bridges which will be delivered by professor holger svensson uh, we have his recorded lectures and uh, there will be also a three lecture course on fatigue design of bridges which will take place in october uh, you know end so uh, you can see that our calendar is quite full for next three months and there is a lot Uh, in our uh, table for you all uh, i wish to express my sincere thanks to ia structi secretariat for putting up these series of webinars one after the other to benefit the structural engineering fraternity in this difficult circumstances if you want to know more about us please visit our website uh, all the details are available now secondly about the participation certificate i would like to inform you all that we will give e certificates to participants on request anyone who is desirous to have a participation certificate may send an re email request to the secretariat and uh, we will issue the certificate after checking whether a uh, participant has attended the full webinar or not thirdly we have today i just wanted to inform that we have an expert panel today an eminent panel comprising some of the eminent personalities in the field of wind engineering we have professor prem krishna dr lakshmi parmeshwaran professor mahesh tandon and dr harshvardhan subarao in the panel they will interact with the speaker of the day after the presentation during the qa session questions from the participants will be taken up uh, only after the end of the uh, you know presentation by dr suresh and if you have any question uh, kindly write in our q and a tab at the bottom of your screen and um, as a moderator i will pick up these questions uh, and uh, pose it to the speaker uh, i sincerely thank you all participants for taking time out and being here today i also thank dr suresh kumar who agreed to share his experience and thoughts with us and with this uh, i would like to welcome dr suresh to take over from me and start his presentation over to you sir thank you alok ji uh, good morning to you all and uh, before i go on with the subject matter i would like to thank i extract for uh, uh, for carrying out this exercise and accepting to conduct this webinar and also thanks to all the panelists and the other bodi team members to uh, do this because 
there is lots of groundwork behind this. Uh, before again, I start uh, more on the subject matter. Some of Father Bredia's key experiences uh, I'm showing here. Uh, you can see Messina Street and Golden Gate Bridge and Stone Cutters Bridge, Hackman Arrows below our deck. There are a number of bridges here we have done in the past uh, four decades. And uh, not only just that uh, we are doing bridges, we are also doing a number of arises, which was mentioned earlier. The current Dallas Tower, Burj Khalifa, and the Kingdom Tower, which is under construction right now. This is just a brief about who we are, and if you want to know more about it, you can go to Arthropodia's website. Now the outline of this uh, presentation. Um, like uh, uh, Aloji mentioned that I'll be mostly concentrating on the basics, very fundamentals. I'm not uh, getting too much into the details. Uh, fundamentals are important. So I'll be spending some time in the introduction part followed by the rest of the topics. So for instance, wind climate analysis, uh, which is uh, basically applied for tech pylons as well as cables, which is useful for all of these uh, uh, elements. Then desktop stability assessment, that is for deck and pylon. Then uh, section model test, Basically, we are talking about only DAC and then 3D buffeting where DAC pylon cables should be addressed. Then finally, with some conclusion. So this is basically, you can say, the most essential to be done for any bridge. Uh, that is why I picked up these topics, not anything, any detailed topics, which will be in the future uh, webinars, which you can see down, uh, elastic window study, vehicle-induced vibrations, pedestrian induced vibrations and supplementary damping considerations, cable stability analysis, full scale measurement, self monitoring, retrofitting, and these topics can be taken up, can be uh, given webinars in the future. So let us look at what is the most essential that is required, and that is what uh, this uh, webinar is going to be. So starting with introduction, I mean, these, these videos have been seen a number of times uh, by everybody, so I don't have to talk too much about it. Uh, you can see that some of the important thing here is you, you have to look at the span by width ratio and the span by depth ratio, as well as the weight. Uh, and just for comparison, I'm putting Golden Gate Bridge on the side, span by width 146, 1 to 46, and span by depth on one is to 168 and weight is 21 ton per meter. So this was about three years before it got opened up in 1937. In comparison to 1940, they were trying to do something extraordinary, uh, but uh, there are some issues happened and uh, the bridge collapsed. And this one was shown by uh, Dr. Lakshmi earlier, uh, Volvograd bridge undergoing BIO oscillations Finally, it got uh, arrested by using dampers, which I think in her presentation she already showed. So this is uh, purely vortex shedding, vortex induced oscillations. You can see Angus McDonald Bridge in uh, Halifax, Canada. This is a fence system which is undergoing vibrations. And uh, finally, uh, we did the internal test on this and uh, found a solution as a small damper added to the to each one of these tubes, basically. So vibrations can be caused to not only just for the whole bridge, but also to the fence. And vibrations are not just caused by wind, but also by pedestrians. This is Millennium Bridge, London. You can see the vibrations there, the lateral oscillations, because the bridge had frequency in the same uh, frequency as uh, humans walk. It's about 0.75 hertz, one hertz, which we are not going to talk about pedestrian induced vibration today, but I just want to show how many different types of issues which can happen to the bridge. Uh, you can have instability, you can have vortex induced oscillations, you can have buffeting, which I think buffeting is typically happens to all structures, not only just for bridges. Uh, why this is happening? 
Okay, so that is something we have to look at it. That is what I want you to, I want, I want to bring you to. Uh, for instance, the lightweight, that is something that we have to be careful. 10 to 50 ton per meter. These are typical uh, weights of the bridges. Pedestrian bridges typically less than five ton per meter. And the major issue the bridges are facing is supports are only at the end. So contrary to town buildings where gravity helps, uh, in this case, it does not. So that is the reason, that's one of the major reason we have an issue and we have stability issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as you know, that the lot of theory that we use in bridges today is all, uh, I mean, uh, coming from aeronautical engineering. The, the wing flutter and the wing instability, et cetera, et cetera, has been uh, studied for decades in the aircraft industry. So which has been, we are using it in bridges, number of things from aeronautical engineering. So look at the largest aircraft, Airbus 380, which has 550 tons. And if you divide this by the length of the aircraft, then you will see that the weight is approximately uh, of that of a pedestrian. Of course, these two systems are different, but I, all I wanted to say is it's very lightweight and that can bump up and down in the air. But just compare against with the building, that is the whole point of bringing this up because in buildings, as you can see, this is uh, one of those buildings where you can see the weight is 100,000 tons and the weight per floor is approximately 1,500 tons. And then per meter, if you do it, it's approximately 500 ton per meter. So we are talking about something like 10 times a higher weight than a bridge and plus the gravity is at, at its advantage. So you know why now uh, this is hanging on cables, hanging, uh, I mean, the cable supported by the, uh, by the pylons and et cetera. So this is more like a you know, very uh, unstable structure uh, you don't take care of that properly. Now the classification of wind effects on bridges, uh, this I got it from uh, Dr. Guy, um, his master's thesis. You can see there are different types of uh, wind effects. You can say static wind effects and dynamic wind effects. So static wind effects means there are no vibrations, but in dynamic, there are vibrations. So if you look at static wind effects, the, the general uh, mean drag coefficient is effects of time average wind pressures. That is static wind effect. And static instability, there are a few static instability that can happen only is torsional divergence and lateral buckling. And typically these issues are not coming to the bridges all the time. Mostly on bridges, dynamic instability is being uh, seen a number of times. So buffeting response is very, very common. Like I said before, in all structures, buffeting response is very important. Peak factor is approximately 3.5 because you have a kind of a broad spectrum. Uh, your bandwidth is high, so peak factor is high, actually about three, three and a half. And then when you look at dynamic instability, you have a few items there, there are a number of them. Uh, vortex induced oscillations, galloping, torsion instability, uh, classical couple flutter. So VIO, which is vortex-induced oscillations, we'll be talking again and again, where the mass damping parameter is very crucial. So typically we see the amplitudes are getting higher when your uh, mass damping parameter, that is total number is less than about two and a half. So that is when the amplitudes are getting amplified. So VIO in general, it's not really an instability. The problem here is at a particular velocity, you can get huge deflections and then you can have fatigue issues and uh, uh, comfort issues. But the other three items, galloping, torsion instability, and classical flutter, they are the instabilities. For instance, galloping and torsion instabilities are single degree of freedom system. Galloping is basically a heaving motion, then torsion instability is more like a pitching motion. Then couple flutter means both heaving and pitching coupled. So that is how this been, that is two degree of uh, freedom system. So when you talk about galloping, a little bit more is coming in a few other trans, uh, slides. Basically you have your uh, negative lift uh, slope. So DZZ, 
by d alpha less than zero, that means you have a negative slope, typically happens for b by d less than five, uh, the, the breadth by depth ratio. And then in torsion instability, cross-section h, uh, torsional frequency very low, including b by d less than five, uh, very likely you can have torsion instability happening. And then classical flutter where uh, many of these things affects, but along with that, uh, you also look at the torsional frequency divided by vertical frequency less than two, there is a potential for a couple flutter. So these are some of the parameters we use to find out whether the bridge will get into any, any type of instability. Uh, pictorially, I'm showing some of these facts here. You can see uh, the, the bottom figure where you can see the peak rotation in degree versus wind speed. And you can see the green line, which is the easiest line that you can um, understand, uh, which is nothing but as the wind speed increases, the buffeting response increases as a squared fashion. And uh, you can see the buffeting response keeps increasing as the wind speed increases. This is more like a turbulent uh, induced buffeting. You can see the green uh, time series just above that. So it's more like a random excitation. Your spectra is uh, broad banded, your peak factor is three and a half. All of those things happen uh, in those cases. Uh, you can also look at the vortex induced oscillations, which is a self limit, uh, limiting response where at a particular frequency, the bridge is getting excited. And typically this happens at low velocities. That, that is one of the major concern because the low velocity can happen, uh, can occur all the time. And then I think if such deflections are going to happen, definitely fatigue issues, comfort issues can happen. So, uh, that is this blip that you can see underneath. Then you can also see a red line, which is just taking off. That is the flutter part where there is no coming back. It, it just keeps increasing as the speed increases or even without speed increase, you can still getting increased because your aerodynamic damping is getting negative and uh, the damping, the overall damping is going to be negative and so that the vibration will never uh, stabilize. A few more um, slides on uh, the, the flow phenomena. So here again, I mean, you can, um, see the vertical response versus wind speed. And uh, you can see the vortex shedding hump, which typically happens at low uh, velocity, but it can happen sometimes on higher velocities too, because your second order mode can get excited too. And then it just takes off. And that is the portion where you are going to have uh, the uh, uh, instability because it is not uh, a, a normal motion. It is getting violent motion. This is more like a heaving motion. So it goes up and down uh, vertically. And uh, um, when the wind is coming and hitting the bridge, of course, there will be slight uh, tilting as well, which is not shown in this particular diagram, but definitely uh, the bridge is getting into very unstable motion when your overall damping is getting into negative. So you may have negative aerodynamic damping as the speed increases. Uh, this will basically eat away your structural damping and finally the damping will become zero and then it goes to negative and that is when it is, it is going to vibrate violently. Torsional motions approximately the same. I mean, torsional response, but the pitching uh, moment is going to happen. So basically in this case, it is uh, doing angular uh, rotations where the wind is going to see the underneath of the bridge or the top of the bridge, and uh, then it will get into violent motions. So basically it will it'll increase the uh, angle of attack uh, to a certain extent, and then immediately the inertia will uh, keep the bridge uh, coming down violently. Then the bridge is going to get attacked from the top and then keep increasing that type of oscillations. This is turbulent buffering that, like I said, I mean, this is nothing uh, fancy because these type of motions are common even on any structure actually. But when you talk about galloping as well as uh, flutter, this is not common in turbulence uh, because where, uh, as you know, one of the reason is that uh, the gravity at its advantage plus uh, the, the VIO is not that sharp. Actually it is mixed with heavy buffering. So you're, your spectra is more broadbanded, 
you may have a slight reduction in peak factor, but not too much. And then uh, uh, it will never get into flood. Another reason is the mass, huge mass in comparison to the bridges. This is the Tacman arrows showing the pictorial representation of the vortices being formed at the top and the bottom. So as you can see in this angle of attack to the extreme side, you are getting a huge vortex at the top and then it is sucking the bridge uh, to the more positive directions. And then the inertia will bring the bridge back uh, down. And then the big vortex is happening at the leading edge at the underneath of the bridge. So this on and off motions are keep increasing and finally to the collapse of the bridge. Now, one of the serious questions I think everybody wanted to know is when to consider wind study. And uh, this is, uh, RWDA suggested this screening criterion long back. And uh, you can see one of those equations there, WT, this is uh, a parameter which we calculate. The equation is written just on the side. SE is quota number, B by L, B by D, F, B by B. And I am not going through each one of these parameters. One is the, the aspect ratio. Two of them are aspect ratio. Is one is the reduced frequency. And eventually, if you multiply all of these things together, uh, if you are getting a number which is lower than one, uh, that is when you wanted to carry out the wind engineering study. We have tested this number of times. Uh, this database of 44 bridges is being plotted. I think this uh, graph itself is old, already maybe five years old. We never updated afterwards. So you can see various spans here. I mean, main span, we, we did as low as 100 or little more than 100 meters, then going all the way to very uh, long uh, span bridges. And this area is the area where test is required. Like I said, WT less than uh, one is the number. Few other aspects are also, you can see other simple indications are there. Typically, we say that foot bridges main span longer than 50 to 60 meters. Uh, we had to do wind tunnel test. Uh, highway bridges main span longer than about 300 feet, which is about 100 meters. Fundamental period higher than one second, uh, lower than one hertz. And, and also the bridges with the bluff uh, cross sections with solid and high barriers, uh, which may have huge aerodynamic influence. And that is when you have to do the tunnel test. Uh, the essential wind engineering studies required, uh, we need to do wind climate analysis. That is very important in a few slides. You'll come to know why this is very crucial in uh, carrying out. I mean, it is crucial in carrying out all types of uh, for all types of structures, not only just bridges. Uh, desktop stability assessment, because we may want to know whether this bridge will get into any kind of instability before even we get into the wind tunnel test. Uh, because what if the bridge is already uh, very in a, in a bad condition, then probably we don't want to do the test. Um, we may have to come up with some solutions before we go to go for the test. So. When you go for the test, then you go for section model test, followed by buffeting analysis. So in section model test, if the bridge is not stable, then we have to do mitigation measures, which I'll be showing, and then followed by buffeting analysis, because you'll get all the static uh, load coefficients as well as aerodynamic derivatives from the section model test to carry out basically the 3D buffeting analysis in time domain. In climate analysis, uh, this is the famous uh, process G, uh, Allen G. Danforth's wind loading chain and wind climate is obviously the most important uh, link of uh, this chain in order to calculate wind load on any structure. So typically we get the data from airports, weather stations, but one need to be very careful about the reliability of the existing data. Some uh, data may be missing, some data could be an outlier, so we have to appropriately uh, do the analysis for those uh, data. Then sometimes we don't have enough data basically because uh, these locations could be the coastal lines where the measurements may not be there in cyclonic uh, times. So we may have to do Monte Carlo simulations and that is what is being typically done in all countries. And if you have a, a, a complex terrain case where you don't have any data, we can still simulate the data using WARF modeling. This is a numerical model which you can 
uh, do uh, using the upper atmospheric data and bring it down to the earth uh, uh, surface level. And then you can predict the uh, wind speeds at any location on earth. And uh, this has been widely used even to uh, build maps for different countries. Uh, return periods we are interested in is typically 20, 100, 1,000 year return period and 10,000 10, year return periods. All I can say is uncertainty in speeds leads to conservative assumptions and elevates the demands and, uh, and finally to uneconomical structures. So one has to be very careful what are the speeds that we are considering for design. And when you do such analysis, the, the curves are going to be similar to what you are seeing right now here, basically return period versus uh, not only just three second gust wind speed, you will also look at uh, 10 minute mean wind speed or hourly mean wind speed, which are easy. I mean, you can convert the three second to any averaging time. Uh, so this is quite an important curve because you will get a 20 year return period, 100 year return period, 1000 year return period and 10,000 year return period wind speed. And, and the use of those we'll be discussing in a, in a, in a bit. Another criteria that uh, one may look at, it's whether the predominant winds are coming and hitting the bridge uh, perpendicular to the bridge or not. Because typically perpendicular to the bridge, wind direction perpendicular to the bridge is the most important direction for bridges are concerned. So if it is coming at an angle, then we do have some, uh, I mean, some way of reducing the wind speed uh, for consideration for design. Uh, there are ways to tackle this effect. And uh, there is one method which is called a crossing method. You can look at all directions and try to see what is the probability of wind coming perpendicular to the bridge with that particular return period or risk level of accidents. So uh, I'm not getting into the details. So this is something very important when you do uh, bridge studies. I'm showing you topographical effects too. Sometimes the, the topography is quite complicated. Here you can see Tintagel pedestrian bridge about 75 meter span in England. And here it is between two kind of a hill, hilly region can really push through this gap. And uh, the, the, the speed here is not going to be similar to a, a, a normal plane uh, uh, topography. So we need to spe do special studies with regard to what is the funneling effect? Is there any steering effect, et cetera, et cetera. So we did such studies for this particular bridge. You can see the model. This is one is to 500 topographical model. And we use, uh, for, we use Cobra probe uh, to uh, measure uh, three-dimensional turbulence as well as mean flow. And uh, I'm not getting into any of these details, but you can see that you can have, uh, I mean, mean uh, wind directions, uh, mean horizontal wind directions as well as vertical wind directions. You can also get the mean flow and turbulence in all three axes. Um, you can see the topography can be very, very complex sometimes. And uh, without these type of studies, um, I, in my opinion, we may be shooting in the dark with respect to the uh, uh, wind speed as well as turbulence. This is a, one of our old project, Anjikat Arch Bridge in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, you can see very tough terrain conditions with mountainous terrain. And we did the simulation uh, uh, at a particular scale, I believe, if I remember correctly, one is to 3,000. And then you can see this particular gorge is somewhere between 240 to 270. Uh, so regardless of from wherever the, the, the wind is coming in the upper atmosphere, most of the time the wind is passing through these gorge perpendicular to the bridge. So which is very interesting after doing the test, uh, we came to know about that. I'm showing some of those results. I don't want to go through uh, very, um, I mean, in, in great detail, but you can see 240 is the direction. Uh, this particular direction is 240 in the upper atmosphere. And then at the bridge deck level, the horizontal direction is 234. And hitting the bridge from underneath, sorry, from the top uh, five degrees. So things like that. So you can get vertical angles of attack and you can get horizontal angles of attack. And uh, while uh, the upper atmosphere is from somewhere else. 
and also see from 240 degree you are getting maximum mean wind hitting the bridge as well. So we could predict all of these things by looking at uh, uh, topographical model. And uh, finally, the outcome is we predict mean hourly speed, 10 minute speed, as well as three second speed at the deck level. And this can be utilized for design. Uh, so all I wanted to say is many bridges are coming in tougher terrains where basically the code speed is not really um, uh, applicable because the local flow is going to get affected by, uh, by the mountains. So once the wind speed has been taken care of, we immediately get into desktop stability assessment. Uh, lots of experience here because we have been doing bridges for a long time. We have a database. That database can be utilized to uh, come up with, okay, a particular section is stable or not. And sometimes the 2D CFD can be utilized as well to see whether the vortices are getting intensified, uh, whether the upwind uh, deck vortices are hitting the downwind uh, uh, deck, et cetera, and et cetera. So these things can be done using 2D CFD as well, which can um, supplement uh, the experience. Uh, so you can get some early notification in terms of any potential problems and if there is any potential problem, how to mitigate and things like that. So that is where this will come in handy. And in certain cases, you can also apply uh, basically the mitigation aspects uh, as well. So we are applying a mitigation aspects. You can see the top is getting very huge vortices on both sides and uh, definitely this is not going to be nice for the bridge. Then by putting fairing and the gate vein, you can see those things are getting killed. Uh, so you don't have much of an issue at the, uh, the, the bottom figure. And uh, by the way, these are not dynamic models. Uh, this is static models. So that is one of the trouble. I mean, if you want to make it dynamic models, uh, I mean, this is going to take a lot of time. And I don't think eventually we have to go back to the tunnel anyways to confirm uh, whatever that you're finding with this. Uh, there's another CFD study in this case, I think the, the we, uh, we wanted to reduce uh, the gas speed happening to the traffic, uh, cut down the gas speed. We put uh, fences and this fence is going to reduce the speed the 30 to 40% at the traffic level. And that was the study done in CFD, then finally confirmed through uh, internal tests. And uh, CFD helps in reducing the number of uh, tests. So that is, I uh, wanted to give you something here. I mean, CFD can give early indications and reduce the number of internal tests. And uh, once you find your kind of a solution through CFD and you're kind of satisfied, then you go back to the internal and test that particular condition and then confirm it. Now, moving on to section model test. This is the probably the largest uh, portion of uh, the whole uh, presentation. Uh, this uh, particular slide is a bit heavy, sorry for that. And here we need some criteria. I mean, what criteria we are looking to pass uh, for stability as well as for texture. So for stability, I mean, as I told before, flutter is uh, one of the uh, stability issue. And in flutter uh, at construction stage, thousand year return period, uh, the onset speed should be uh, onset speed for flutter should be above 1000 year return period speed. Uh, because as you know, the flutter is a uh, instability and we don't want that to happen at the construction stage or in the completed stage. So in the completed stage, we have to pass this criteria uh, even a bit more stringent. We had to pass 10,000 year return period speed. Uh, these criteria are coming from US and we have been using this for a number of bridges. There are different versions in different countries. I'm not getting in there uh, because you can see in certain codes, addresses 1.2, 1 1.3 times uh, uh, the design uh, speed and all those criteria are available. But we frequently use this and this has been widely used in so many bridges as well. But at higher angles of attack, this is another interesting thing. One can reduce the wind speed criteria if you are sure that the steering angle 
for the bridge is zero, if let us say the steering angle is zero, then uh, for higher angles of attack, uh, we could uh, say that, I mean, the probability of wind coming and hitting the bridge at three degree or six degree angles of attack is less. And because of that, we can slightly, uh, you know, reduce the speed criteria. And that could go to, to the extent of 20% reduction in the onset speed. So this is something we looked at it in certain bridges. So this is uh, again, based on experience. Uh, state of flutter, if the torsional amplitude exceeds one and a half degree. Uh, that is when we say that it is getting into flutter. And as far as vortex shedding is concerned, there are uh, criteria again, 5% of gravity up to 30 mile an hour. That is about 13 meter per second and 10% of gravity from 30 to 50 mile an hour, which is 22 meter per second. Then if above 50 mile an hour, then it becomes a strength or fatigue issue, not a comfort issue anymore. Uh, so regardless of where the water shedding is happening, we need to be careful because uh, in case of very high amplitude, definitely the loading is going to be higher so uh, probably the design is going to get uh, beefed up and it is going to be a problem. So we need to be addressing that. Uh, but just for your uh, understanding for tall buildings, we are looking at 1.8% of gravity as the comfort limit. So you can see how stringent the tall buildings are. Actually, we have to arrest the motions at 1.8% uh, G in comparison to the bridges where it is uh, higher. Uh, so this, I think, uh, uh, again, I mean, depending on the code that you look at it, things can be slightly different, uh, which I'm not uh, going to go through right now. So this is more like a pass or fail test. Um, if it passes, of course, it is good. The shape is good. And if it fails, then we have to find a better shape. It's something like that. Okay, carried out at the very preliminary stage of the test. Uh, so aerodynamic phenomena, flutter, vortex shedding, buffeting, these are the things we are looking at primarily. Flutter, as you know, many types, we are looking at galloping, torsional flutter, couple flutter, all of those things are covered. Vortex shedding is covered, buffeting. Buffeting is uh, kind of symbol in comparison to the rest of it. In case of instability, we have to come up with the remedial measures. That is very important. And sometimes it takes uh, a long route. Sometimes it takes a shorter route. Um, sometimes it can be finished very fast. But depending on the case, it is very difficult to say. And also it is very difficult to say a, a particular remedial measure which happens, which is good for one bridge, may not be good for another bridge. So we can't generalize the situation. We can say these are the various types of techniques one can use it, but whether it will work for your bridge or not, we don't know. And that is where these tests comes in handy. Uh, you can uh, keep on testing by putting these extraneous elements to your bridge and see at what conditions it is getting stable. And also it is very tricky. I have to tell you these tests are very tricky because certain cases where things are working for certain angles of attack, but if you change the angles of attack to higher degrees, then it may not work. So you have to have, I mean, lots of decisions made at the time of the test, okay? And uh, the other results you will get out of this, once, let us say your bridge is stable, you will get uh, static uh, coefficients as well as aerodynamic derivatives out of these tests. And these uh, parameters can be utilized for your very buffeting analysis. So uh, in a way, I want to say that you won't do 3D uh, buffeting analysis uh, without confirming the stability of the bridge. So what is a section model study? As the name suggests, it is only a section of the bridge. Only a section of the bridge, typically being selected from the middle of the bridge. And in certain cases, very, very rarely, if you have uh, sections changing as you go from the middle to the pylons or something like that, then we had to make a decision whether uh, we have to do two section model studies or one is sufficient and all of those things one has to uh, 
design. Uh, you can see the Tinder Gel production bridge here, and you can see also our, uh, the rig which hold uh, this bridge. Basically, what is section model? This is a section of the bridge. This particular bridge is uh, typically between 30 and 80. This is around, I don't remember exact number, but about 60, if I remember correctly. And this is hanging on springs. Basically, the exact geometry of the bridge, the mass of the bridge is simulated on a particular scale, of course, uh, right here. All these elements together will simulate the geometry as well as the mass. But the stiffness is created by the spring and the spring is right here. You can see the springs are on the rig itself. The spring will simulate the stiffness of the bridge. Then the damping is simulated by the magnetic dampers. Uh, you can individually control the torsional damping as well as the vertical damping. You can also individually control the vertical frequency as well as the torsional frequency using springs. And this is basically a three-dimensional array. You can also simulate the horizontal motions. Uh, but what we have seen so far is uh, the, the coupling between the horizontal and the vertical as well as the torsion is not too much in number of cases that we have been doing. So we generally don't simulate that. We are always going with uh, uh, torsion and vertical only. And uh, for drag coefficients, of course, we have to get uh, uh, horizontal as well. We have to get slopes of horizontal drag coefficient, uh, mean as well as uh, uh, the slope. Uh, this is uh, Golden Gate Bridge. You may be wondering, the Golden Gate Bridge is existing since 1937. It is back to the tunnel in terms of uh, retrofits. So we are doing carrying out some tests right now. So this is the section of the bridge. Uh, you can see in great detail, I mean, how detailed that you want to go with the modeling, you can see from this. I don't have to tell you. You can see the trust work and etc. with all of those members and etc. So sometimes you wonder why do we go to that detail? Uh, it is very, very relevant. Okay? If you miss something, you don't have a clue how this is going to affect. We have so many cases where we try to simplify and we can get a different response. So we don't want to play with this. We have to go as, as uh, similar to uh, the, the full scheme. This is the section model study of the Golden Gate, which is right now undergoing. You can see the vertical mode, which is very low uh, frequency with the torsional mode, which is also uh, relatively low frequency. And uh, the motions that you're seeing is related to the torsional vibrations, uh, which is happening at uh, 0.189 Hertz is more, more or less purely torsional issue. And uh, this is, uh, like I said, this is going through uh, uh, rigorous uh, uh, the retrofitting measures with uh, fences and other kinds of elements, including fences, that's what I'm hearing. Uh, you can see how well you can simulate these things in the wind tunnel. And you would expect at some frequency it is going to go up and down because you can calculate these things as well. Uh, but on an open truss uh, section, it is quite uh, difficult because uh, you can't just take uh, B as uh, just from the top to the bottom of the girder because you have some openings as well. So it's a bit tricky, but based on number of uh, similar tests, we'll be able to tell exactly where this will happen. And another issue is when bridges are on side by side, there are a number of bridges on side by side nowadays, the interference of one bridge with the other bridge. So we have test rig where you can simulate both dynamic models. These are dynamic models side by side. You can simulate exact frequencies and uh, modes, uh, not exactly uh, the mode shapes, but you are simulating basically torsional uh, mode as well as vertical mode. And you can scale it for higher modes if you want based on these results and all those things. So here one another issue is uh, when, the, when the vehicles are passing, the drag coefficient is going to increase how the interactions between the bridges. This is near uh, in uh, Detroit, uh, Canada border, where at the border, this is what happens because the, the vehicles are standard 
And during that time, the storm comes, the drag is going to be more to the bridge and how this will affect the other bridge and et cetera. So we have done some pretty uh, interesting studies on uh, this particular bridge. This is another shot of another bridge uh, side by side. You can increase the distance. We have flexibility in increasing the distance uh, to a particular level. I mean, you can't go too far away, but uh, we have approximately covered all the distances which typically happens in the full stage. So section models are basically a rigid model. You are hanging this model on a spring. You are taking care of the frequencies through springs. You are taking care of the damping through magnetic dampers, not like in an elastic model. You know, in an elastic model, you are taking care of uh, your mass, stiffness, damping, everything through the structure itself. But that's not the way we are doing here. This is also not a three-dimensional bridge because you're not simulating the whole bridge, you're simulating only a portion of the bridge, uh, something like 100 to 150 meters or something like that, depending on the scale, that's what you're simulating. The scale I already told you, uh, you can virtually use any material you want, brass, aluminum, wood, plexiglass, and uh, you have to follow non-dimensional parameters like in any other wind tunnel test. Um, some equations are given here, which I'm not going to go through everything. This is the Reynolds number scaling. Uh, so you can see uh, masses should be reduced and the moment of inertia should be reduced. The speed will be reduced as well. And the frequency ratio has to be maintained in the model scale uh, with the prototype. Damping should be similar. And uh, these are from uh, fluid mechanics principles, geometric similarity kinematic similarity and dynamic similarity has to be simulated properly in the tunnel. Or one another uh, challenge that you are going to get is because the scale is bigger, you have to go through partial turbulence simulation because if you don't do that, you will amplify the inertial response uh, coming out of the test. This is one of the example of box glitter bridge in uh, going through section model test. This is approximately a kilometer long and then uh, uh, this bridge has a beautiful shape. Uh, and uh, you can see some other parameter. This is the first vertical and the torsion motions. You can see the frequencies uh, right here. So frequency 0.1 to 1 hertz and 0.347 hertz at full scale. In the model scale, it is higher frequency based on the scaling principles. But the ratio, if you look at it, is very close. And then deck mass. You can see uh, some tons per meter and kilograms. And you can see in the model scale, it is reduced based on the scale. Then equivalent other things, MMI and et cetera. And vertical damping and torsional damping is going to be similar to uh, what is in the full scale. So this is a suspension bridge. So we uh, thought of uh, going for a lower damping at 0.25 and 0.3%. Uh, these are the results. You can see peak vertical deflection. Uh, you can get a blip at very low frequency, very low velocity at about 6.5 meter per second. And this deflection is about 0.6 meter. Even though it is passing the 5% G criteria, uh, this is not a good thing for the bridge. So we asked them to relook at basically the shape of the bridge uh, for reducing this amplitude, even though it passed. But if you look at the peak torsional deflection in degrees, it is uh, taking off after the fluffer criterion speed. This is the critical speed, 46 meter per second. So this is taking off after that. So there is no flutter issue on this bridge, but there is a vortex shedding issue, uh, which is uh, basically uh, to be fixed uh, through um, uh, aerodynamic. So aerodynamics, uh, the airfoil, I mean, number of experiments being done on airfoil, the airplanes that we fly today, I mean, gone through number of testing in the past. So I'm giving some history here, 1873, the airfoil looks like a thin plate, then slowly increase the size of the plate, the depth, basically, because they found out that even though the drag is very low, but the stability is not being maintained. And even this airfoil has stability issue, as you know, if you take uh, steep angles of attack, then you can have stalling can happen. 
so which is a different issue we are not going to talk too much on that but this i think we learned a lot of lesson out of these aerodynamic and in daily life i mean we are using aerodynamics in in so many places you can see aeronautics uh, trains how high speed trains are being modeled to reduce the drag and in sports aerodynamics is heavily influenced uh, this uh, this uh, aerodynamics so you can see the tear tear drop shape of the cyclist in order to win the race uh, the cyclist has the, the leaning position you see uh, in order to win the race because if you don't then obviously your drag is going to be too much you take more time and then in sports uh, balls these stitches and etc i'm not going through the details but all of these are not just for fun purpose you are putting it there is a specific purpose aerodynamic purpose to for these stitches especially in golf ball these dimbles without these dimbles if you hit the ball it is not going to fly longer distance so with the dimbles it can go further distance so we can really learn a lesson out of all of these examples in front of us and that's what we do in bridges so in aerodynamics you can see airfoil versus a, a bridge airfoil has a cd of 0.045 or i mean depending on the camber shape and etc it can be slightly different but in golden gate i mean you are seeing still this is a bluff section our sections are bluff so we are getting very high drag coefficient on 0.3 compared to this we can't build anything like this in in bridges we can go to as far as possible i mean as the depth as possible then you will get into some other kinds of problems you can also use end fairing you can see end fairing and baffle plates underneath the bridge to uh, disturb the vortex system if you disturb the vortex system the you want to basically disturb the coherence of the what is is happening at the top of the bridge versus the bottom of the bridge and you don't want those two what is is to be talking each other you want to disturb the what is is you want to disturb the coherence and then you can reduce the response not only just the vio you can reduce the response stability you can maintain the stability as well so uh, that those kind of techniques have been widely used in many bridges so some examples that i am showing with some results because otherwise i would have got higher peaks without these elements and going above the uh, above the acceptable levels gate vanes uh, this has been used in certain bridges this great belt is a bridge uh, it is being used so there are lots of other techniques i'm not going through uh, various techniques but basically you want to get an aerodynamic good aerodynamic shape the the fairings have been widely used in many bridges already existing today uh like i said once the bridge stability is maintained and we are done with the stability we go for the force and moment coefficients we can measure this at various angles of attack uh, right from minus 10 degrees to plus 10 degrees we can get the drag coefficient we can get the lift coefficient as well as the slope the slope is also very important and we utilize this for predicting the loads on our bridges and the moment coefficient as well uh then the last item on this particular test is the aerodynamic derivatives and i am putting some equations down you might be knowing already these equations these are self excited motions with h1 star h2 star up to h4 star which is heaving motion then a1 star to a4 star is more like a pitching motion and now there are theories you know for even horizontal motion p starts which i am not showing here that is not very typical uh, typically we don't uh, use it in our analysis but you can see these are very important and out of this i just want to give you some important stuff h1 star and a2 star is the most important one and they are controlling the aerodynamic damping so whenever you get a negative it is going uh, as the use you are getting increased and increased it is getting negative means it's uh, much more stable if it is negative and going up like in this case in a2 star this is not very good this is increasing this is getting into instability so in this particular case we used a fairing and when we use the fairing we could uh, reduce the slope of this and that is the blue line that you see in a2 star we can improve the situation and we want ideally to be either at zero level or going down uh, uh, so i just want to simply say the h1 star a2 star the most important 
but we do measure all of these things using system identification technique in the venture. Okay, uh, the last item is uh, 3D buffeting analysis. So once, uh, so far what we have done is we found a stable section based on the section analysis, section test, uh, initially started with the desktop assessment and followed by section test. We found a section, we found the static coefficients and the slope, and we also found the aerodynamic derivatives. So we have already lots of information uh, from the section model test and which can be utilized for 3D buffeting analysis. So 3D buffeting analysis is done everything in time domain in the computer and where we have to model the bridge, uh, the tower, as well as the cables, everything we need to model like a, you can say with appropriate stiffness and like a, uh, I would say a SAP model kind of a thing. We used lumb, uh, lumb mass system at various sections with all the properties and et cetera. And you can see, you can simulate for, pre vibration analysis in the computer, you can get exactly the modes that the structural engineers are going to predict. And we can get everything. We can come to know how the bridge is behaving and et cetera. But then the main element which is missing is the wind. So we have to create the wind as well. So that is uh, lots of models available. As you know, Arima model, auto regressive models, there are many other models are available where you can simulate correlated wind time series hitting the bridge, which is very easy. I mean, in terms of bridges, it's very easy to do it because you don't have vertical variation of wind. You don't have much vertical variation of wind. You do have some because you have vertical turbulence as well as lateral turbulence and longitudinal turbulence. That will come out of the time series itself. You have all of those components which are important as far as hitting the bridge is concerned in time domain. And coherence is another important thing because you know, uh, when you are talking about a long bridge, the middle of the bridge is probably the pressure fluctuations happening at the middle of the bridge is not correlated with pressure fluctuations happening 200 meters down the line. So you need coherence function. So all of those things are already well known. We could easily simulate the, the time series and we can excite the bridge we can, we can get the response of the bridge. Uh, we can get deflections, we can get accelerations at any point we need, not only just on deck, we can get it on pylons at the top, at the middle of the pylons. We can get it, if it is an arch bridge, we can get it on arch bridge, arch, and then we can also get it on cables. And after looking at those, uh, we, can, uh, we can come to know the loading. Basically, we can predict the loading because uh, once you know the deflections and the accelerations, uh, we can come up with equivalent static load, which can induce such deflections and such acceleration. Uh, then one other question, I think many people will be thinking that how sure are we uh, with these kind of simulations? Uh, there are a number of uh, calibrations done, for instance, the Hackman Arrows Bridge here uh, we have done, uh, the ultimate is air elastic model. So we have done air elastic model. We have done 3D buffering. And we are comparing uh, basically uh, the response to the bridge and uh, in the, in the normalized power spectra for lateral deflections and vertical deflections. And you can see that the modes have been, several modes, uh, the response is being shown. First lateral mode and third lateral mode. And on the top, on the vertical side, it is uh, first vertical and third vertical and another peak is there. I don't know which uh, mode is that. But you can see how closely you can simulate in 3D wise. Once you are having a good handle on the static coefficients and the slope, as well as the aerodynamic uh, uh, derivatives. Because those are the inputs to the, to the program. So you can see the response in the computer as well. You can see this is uh, a a suspension bridge in Brazil. And you can see the sway deflections as well as vertical deflections are plotted here. But you can also plot the torsion deflections, everything you can get out of the computer. And this particular thing can be utilized uh, for predicting loads. Uh, 
uh, once you have done that, then you come up with a number of different scenarios with uh, uh, on the deck, vertical load, uh, lateral load, as, as well as torsion load. And then on the tower, similar patterns. I mean, you have a long wind load and a cross wind load and torsion loads. Then on the cable, similar thing, you have all kinds of loads on the cables as well. So you can have number of load cases. So certain load cases may be following certain modes. So typically, I would say that for any complicated bridge, you can get easily uh, 20 to 30 load cases, different load cases with different types of motions and et cetera. Uh, we don't work with uh, typically with uh, uh, load combination factors like in uh, tall buildings, but here we provide load cases uh, directly so that you can apply to the uh, model, your computer model to do the rest of the design. This is Tacomanaris, by the way. It's a very old project. And uh, uh, this is shown some uh, load scenarios on the tower as well as on the deck. Uh, like I said before, I mean, we have to capture the peak dis displacements and as well as the peak uh, accelerations. And th these kind of stuff you get when you do air elastic directly, but in the uh, time domain you can get as an output as well. In aerolastic, you'll measure it using lasers and using accelerometers. But here, the computer will generate uh, such files for you, and then you can utilize those files to create the load scenarios. So I'm uh, towards the end of the presentation, some uh, um, concluding remarks. So wind effects on bridges are quite different from traditional high-rise buildings. Um, I wanted to distinguish that very clearly here because in high-rise buildings, we never uh, typically find any instability. Seldom, seldom we talk about instability. We talk about a long wind. We talk about a lot on crosswind. Tall buildings having lots of issues with crosswind. But those are not unstable motions, okay? Because we are talking about huge mass. Unless otherwise, your structure is like a spire or something, very thin structure, slender, okay, that can get into instability. It can get into galloping, it can get into flutter, depending on the type of structure. But typical high-rise buildings will never get into that region. But bridges are not like that. Bridges can easily get into trouble uh, because the way it is being designed and it is lightweight and gravity is not an advantage for bridge so things like that. Stability issues are a serious concern at completed and construction stages. At, at construction stage, it can be even tougher situations without proper support and et cetera. I remember cases where it is passing on uh, completed stage, but it is not passing on construction stage. So where you have to have temporary solutions, like temporary strut tie down cables on, particularly on the on the tower, because I remember those cases being experienced in Tacman Arrows long back, and they had the tie down cables and temporary struts while constructing the tower before the, the original strut came into place. The, the towers are going uh, kind of unstable motions. Uh, mitigation measures for stability purposes uh, requires internal testing. Uh, uh, because we can learn from experience, but like I said before, it is quite surprising, even surprising to us, even though we are doing testing for a long time. I mean, things are working for one bridge, but it's not working for another bridge, uh, which is really uh, surprising. Even the people who are doing testing for a longer period of time, for various reasons. I mean, there are lots of unknown. So that's the reason for going back to the town. Static force and moment coefficients are also known for many cross sections. Um, so we have a database we could utilize at the initial stage to assess whether that can get into any kind of trouble. We can reasonably predict, actually, I would say, we can reasonably predict the, the flutter, uh, whether the bridge will get into any kind of trouble or not at the initial stage without a test. But VIO is a problem. We can predict VIO. We can say that there is going to be a vortex induced oscillation because the scooter number is less than two and a half. 
uh, and it can occur at this speed and etc but predicting the amplitude is very tricky is very very tricky we typically won't do that until the section monitors minimum studies are to be conducted for design and these are the minimum studies and that is what i have been discussing in this seminar in climate study dust of stability assessment section model study 3d buffering analysis so you started with wind climate you got to know wind climate wind speed you got to know from where wind is coming dominant winds are coming whether any potential for reducing the wind speed and all of those things then you get into dust of stability assessment when you say that whether it's going to be stable or not if it is not stable how to modify the section etc then you get into section model test you confirm it you get all your coefficients derivatives etc you get out of the tunnel you go to the computer do a 3d buffering analysis you get all your loading on all the uh, elements then you go for design and further on you go for the rest of the advanced studies to basically tune tune the existing loading cases as well as to get the three dimensionality effect because you don't get three dimensionality especially in the section model but in 3d you will get three dimensionality uh, so you have to go uh, i mean in some cases you go for advanced testing so i hope i made justice to the time which is given to me which is only one hour i don't want to be long with a big presentation but if you have any questions i'm more than happy to answer thank you uh, <clears throat> thank you thank you dr suresh for this uh, fascinating uh, presentation i think uh, i th i the engineers participants cannot have a could not have a better uh, presentation on long span bridges uh, you have given a helicopter view of you know uh, of how uh, wind tests are to be done for long span bridges what are the various features what are the different characteristics of a long span bridge and um, how it is to be done uh, i think we have an elite panel uh, i would request all the panelists to kindly switch on their video so that we can see them and um, i think uh, to be very honest i am not a specialist in wind and uh, some of the presentation material given by yes, dr yes. suresh has gone little over my head as well so i would request the elite panel actually to rather conclude uh, uh, or to give conclusions to uh, or give give remarks you know concluding remarks uh, then i will take up the question and answer so may i request professor prem krishna to uh, give the concluding remarks for this presentation <clears throat> thank you alok uh, uh, this has been really a fascinating lecture from dr suresh consistent with my expectations because i i think every time every time i heard him speak or make a presentation or write a paper it is never short of uh, your expectations it's perfectly done so my compliments to him first of all well the wind uh, engineering is a bit of a tricky issue and it, it is even more tricky when you come to think of uh, these medium to long span bridges which are normally cable bridges so if he is uh, adequately brought that out that it is a tricky affair and uh, of course from the designer's angle there are uh, some codal provisions some empirical expressions and formulae which are given i expect these are conservative uh, because of when you are handling a tricky situation it is better to be conservative and uh, therefore i i would think that as soon as you see something unusual in a bridge either from the point of view of topography or the bridge geometry itself it should ring an alarm right away that it is fine to have these empirical relations and uh, get your first information report from them but then there is something to go on with like for example the chenab bridge 
in JNK and the Anjikhat bridge that uh, Dr. Suresh mentioned. And by the way, it has now become a cable straight bridge. It, it was an arch bridge initially, and now it is a cable straight bridge that they're constructing. But he showed interesting studies of the Anjikhat. Then you have the, the uh, footbridge he showed from the UK. The Golden Gate itself has a topography which is special which makes life difficult for the Golden Gate Bridge off and on. There are vibrations and it has to be taken care of. So as soon as you see something which is other than conventional, other than usual, then one goes ahead and looks at the, the issue of aerodynamics more carefully. Of course, there are uh, CFD is one way you look at it. And uh, CFD, I always say it is uh, in a uh, not a established stage yet where you know you know you can do CFD and then say fine CFD I've done and that's it I don't have to look any further and it's not surprising after all wind tunnel testing has been in place since 1950s in a, in a very elaborate way so it's about 70 years but at CFD people have been working for maybe last 30 years or so to try and use CFD for wind engineering. So in CFD, we have not reached a stage where we have reached in wind tunnel testing. Uh, therefore, I will say, okay, we'll use CFD, but then if uh, uh, we think that there's any chance of uh, the aerodynamic issues have, having to be looked at in more detail, then you go to wind tunnel work and there are the two ways that you do it, sectional model and the full model. The full model is a very big challenge and the sectional model is much simpler. And therefore, mostly it is a sectional model that you would use. Full model only in very, perhaps very large spans of some special requirement. Then you go for full model. Uh, I have a, a couple of things more to say before I... Uh, uh, Dr. Suresh showed fairings on mm -hmm. the sides of a deck, uh, yeah. which improve the aerodynamic uh, uh, performance. Uh, these can also be uh, 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 applied on part of the span. Yes. The yes. fairings don't have to be used throughout the span. That is something yes. I wanted yes. to add as a point. Yes, yes. Yeah. That so, can be so, done. And, and even yeah. the battle plates, similar way. I mean, yes. yes. Maybe 30% of the span or 40% yes. or 35%. Yes. So, yes. As required. This yes. they can be on part of the thing. Correct. Uh, one uh, question I wanted to ask Dr. Suresh. Uh, you know, in your experience with uh, uh, bridges, ca particularly cable straight bridges that you may have studied over the last uh, few years, these are occupying uh, the spans of uh, between 500 plus normally now. They used to be 300 meters used to be a big span for cable straight bridges some years ago. But the last two or three decades, we have seen that they're occupying a much longer uh, span space. 500 meters to about 1,000 meters. How often is it that uh, when a bridge design has come to you for a study, for proving from aerodynamics point of view that you had to go back and tell them some uh, measure to improve the design? Um, I think I would say that for stability point of view, uh, probably number of those bridges are passing, stability point of view. But in most of the cases, if not all, I believe one way or the other, there will be a mitigation measure uh, because uh, BIO is going to happen. And then uh, depending on the amplitude, you may be sometimes barely passing. So sometimes we don't want to barely pass. So then again, you go for slighter modification. So I think I would say that the flutter uh, probably uh, by carefully looking at the B by D ratio or frequencies and ratios and et cetera, one can get out of that trouble kind of easily, but not very easily from VIO because, and that too, that is happening at very low uh, velocities, which is quite a problem for bridge. Uh, so, uh, so you may end up doing something or the other to the bridge in order to make it uh, satisfying. Okay, That Thanks. is the experience. 
Well, thank you. Uh, uh, it is my favorite subject, so I can go on talking. <laughs> but there are other eminent panelists, and there will be questions and answers. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello. Yeah. So may I may I now request uh, Dr. Harsha to please. Yeah, uh, Suresh, thanks for a delightful presentation. Share your thoughts. Yeah. Thanks for a delightful presentation, Suresh. And we really hope that this will be one of the, you know, just a series that have just started. Because most structural engineers have very little competence in the nuances of structural uh, wind engineering. You know, wind engineering in itself and how to assess and how to utilize the results into the design of our long span bridges is something that we still have to catch up with in this country to a large extent amongst the engineers. And it's a it's not a taught subject at colleges. So one can clearly understand, you know, that static wind is okay, but uh, wind which is dynamic is something completely off the wall for most uh, structural engineers. And that's the need which we're trying to plug and have these kind of educational informative seminars, uh, which would be useful. Now, coming to the uh, issues, uh, one, one or two points that come to mind is yes. one is about the representativeness of the model and the tuning of the model that you do, the kind of materials that you use for the model to generate the stiffnesses and masses and, 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 and you know, the aerial strike model, how realistically they are uh, truly representative. And also about the way in which you suspend or affix the model in the wind tunnel. Uh, you know, does that change the characteristics? How much does that affect the actual wind model study that you're doing? The influence of that, the model uncertainty that is introduced by that mm -hmm. is one issue. The yeah. other issue that I'm uh, talking about is, 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 is requesting knowledge about is the wind tunnel test facility that you have in Tivandrum. Yes. Uh, is that being used largely in India now? How, how far ahead are you with it? It's been recently established and uh, you know, how could we approach you and what would be the interface and um, okay. how do engineers come to you and ask, ask you to help them out with, where do you get involved with the project at the concept right. start uh, at the you know in the detailed design when we run into trouble or when we have to develop uh, you know fairings or when do you actually get involved? Right. Okay. Uh, the first question on the modeling. Uh, first of all, remember the section model tests are not an elastic model. Okay. Uh, this is a rigid model. Rigid model means the material is uh, the model that you saw hang, hanging on springs are not going to create any uh, stiffness by itself. The, the, what do you see that particular model, which uh, let's go back to that. Yeah, even this model that you see on the side, this is simulating only the geometry, geometry of the structure and exact geometry of the structure as, as, uh, as close as possible, okay? You may have some trouble in simulating the fences and things like that, you have to make some uh, appropriate wind engineering assumptions there because you can't simulate exactly the way the full scale is. So you need to have some more thoughts behind those things. But the rest of it, everything is exactly being modeled because that is very, very important. And your mass is exactly simulated through that model. So if you weigh, if it, if it is supposed to be 15 kilograms, it is going to be 15 kilograms, okay? Without any stiffness, only the mass and the geometry. Then the springs. Springs are going to, this is hung on springs. The spring is going to create the stiffness. We have multitudes of springs, so we know we spring to use it in order to create the frequencies that we are looking for. Because according to the scale, we are supposed to be creating a particular frequency. Because everything is scaling, scaling down process. So that frequency, which spring is going to give me that frequency? And right now the way that we are doing is that we can control the vertical uh, frequency completely different than the torsional frequency. Okay. So you have a torsional spring separately, you have a vertical spring separately. So which is a great idea because that, in that way, uh, you don't have to use the same springs for both of these things, which will be a, a, a trouble for us. So that is the way that this beam model. So if you are talking about the actual material properties, we never simulate the actual material properties in any internal test. Because that uh, you are leading to probably material non-linearities non and all those things have to be done in a, in a computer. In, even if you do aeroelastic test, 
you'll be simulating the stiffness, you'll be simulating the mass, damping, everything is correct, but the material nonlinearity is not coming into picture. We use uh, balsa wood, we use uh, uh, aluminum, we use brass, we use all kinds of material to make the model. Okay, the, the material doesn't really matter. We are looking for scaled down properties. That's all we are after, okay? And uh, with respect to wind tunnel, the one in Trivandrum is established in 2016, and we have been using that for testing tall buildings, testing roofs, testing solar panels. We are doing testing for many, many structures, except bridge. Because for bridge testing, you need a rig. Uh, we can easily establish a rig. It is not a problem. All we have to do is we have to uh, probably bring it from Canada to here, and we can establish it within no time. Okay, so we didn't do that yet, but we can do that at any time and we can utilize the same tunnel for bridge testing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Suresh. Uh, I request Dr. Lakshmi to please share her thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Suresh, for a very excellent presentation and also really making the participants a feel of wind with the computational fluid dynamics and showing the vertices where they are forming, how the flow is separating, reattaching. It was really excellent, uh, marvelous uh, to see all these things. Um, as you have said that, like you have uh, done a number of sectional model studies uh, for uh, bridges. Uh, so uh, I have a, a query about that, like uh, what is the range of the lift coefficient you are getting for these uh, bridges? Because what I see is that the earlier uh, British standards, they used to give some plus minus 0.75 and now they have uh, improved or uh, enhanced it to plus minus uh, 0.9. So I just uh, want to uh, seek your opinion on this aspect. And the second aspect I would like to uh, point out is that, uh, like you really uh, made people uh, convinced that there is going to be a fatigue because of uh, wind, uh, either by vortex-induced oscillation or also because of buffeting. And I think probably, uh, uh, bridge engineers uh, find it really difficult to accept it, but I think your presentation made it very clear. Uh, the important aspect what I want to uh, tell you is that you showed that you have done recently also some uh, internal studies on um, Golden Gate Bridge. In fact, during the last 80 years, I think number of studies have been done, especially with respect to wind on Golden Gate Bridge and a lot of retrofitting with respect to wind has been done. Uh, what I uh, read recently is that after the recent retrofit, there is some sort of a humming voice, uh, noise coming when the vehicle is passing over the uh, bridge. So uh, what exactly is the retrofit you have specified and why it is happening? Are you studying this? Can you some throw light on this? All right. So first start with the lift coefficient. I mean, lift coefficient is uh, depending on the type of the bridge. I mean, of course, everything depends on the type of the bridge. Not only just the lift coefficient, but also the drag coefficient. But the lift coefficient, one of the lift coefficient is being shown here for a particular bridge. Like you said, the, the numbers going from minus 0.9 to plus 0.9, and those type of uh, typical numbers we do see. but. Uh, if I want to draw a, a two lines above and below, it can be going as low as even minus 0.6. It can go even uh, beyond one or so in certain cases. Okay, those are special circumstances. And so as you know, this slope uh, coefficient, this is positive slope. And uh, this is the bridge is being stabilized and then we do these measurements and that's why we get the positive slope. Otherwise, sometimes we could get a negative slope as well. So I can't give you a concrete answer on the lift coefficient, but I can say it is varying with respect to uh, the bridge uh, geometry. And uh, uh, your question on fatigue. 
a buffeting can create fatigue as well as BIO can get fatigue, but the buffeting fatigue is different. Buffeting fatigue means you have fluctuations in all kinds of frequencies. You have uh, higher fluctuations, which is happening. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, high frequency fluctuations, which is happening. You have low frequency fluctuations. So your uh, bigger fluctuations, that means in terms of the amplitudes are very less and it, the occurrence levels are very less, but the shorter ones are happening numerous times and et cetera. So it is widely varying. So it is, uh, I don't know, uh, to me, the buffeting of fatigue is not very critical to the bridge. To me, VIO fatigue is very critical to the bridge because it is consistently going to happen at that particular wind velocity, which is at a lower wind velocity for, if you count the number of days you are going to get those velocities, you will be really see what is going to happen to the bridge. So the cycles are going to be huge, the amplitudes are going to be huge and numerous cycles which can happen to the bridge. So that is why I believe the VIO fatigue is something uh, very crucial for the bridge and which has to be looked at it in detail. And this is something uh, easily predictable. Uh, that is a good thing because you know the velocity at which it is happening. You know how many times that velocity is going to happen during the design life of, life of your bridge based on your wind climate analysis. And then you know the amplitude. So it is easy to figure out what it will do to the bridge. Uh, the last point on the retrofit on the Golden Gate Bridge, like you said, I mean, the retrofits a number of times it happened in the past, and now they are putting suicidal barriers and some nets and things like that. It is not just because of that the bridge has some, uh, uh, some issues in terms of uh, torsion vibrations. Actually, the bridge had uh, shown some severe vibrations in some of the storms which has been measured in the past. So as a part of the seismic retrofit, they wanted to look at the wind uh, aspect as well. Then uh, when we looked at it, we found out that uh, some of the criteria which has been used before, and except you know, uh, we are talking about 1930s. Uh, at those times, those criteria are not well built and et cetera. So right now we feel that there's a requirement uh, to update the bridge and if your criteria, the onset flutter criteria should pass the 100 mile an hour criteria uh, at the deck level. So that is the reason we go for this. And I heard that there will be some fairings coming onto the bridge as well as a, uh, as a picture in the future. So still the study is going on. Uh, I, sh I, I was able to show this just because uh, this, uh, some of these videos are already in the YouTube. Otherwise, probably I would not have shown in this presentation. So the, the study is still going on. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Suresh. Thank you, Suresh. I will just take one minute. Uh, my question with respect to the lift coefficient uh, came into mind because now the decks are becoming wider, even for the uh, uh, small or medium span bridges. So do you think that the uh, wider decks, uh, because definitely like it has more area for uh, the wind to act on the uh, plan, area is more. So uh, it just came because of uh, the wider uh, width of the deck with respect to the uh, depth, probably like uh, maybe you can just uh, think about it. And uh, if you find something interesting, you can uh, uh, convey that. Thank definitely. you very much. Definitely. Thank you. Dr. Thank you, thank you. I now request Professor Mahesh Tandanji to share his thoughts. I think you have to unmute yourself, sir, first. You are muted, sir. Tandan Saab, you are muted. You kindly unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, sir, we are not able to hear you. I think uh, some problem. Some problem with Tandon Sub's mic or something. He's demuted. Yeah, Tandon Sub, you are you are you have muted yourself. Kindly unmute. 
<laughs> Maybe you can check your uh, settings. Settings. Maybe you, uh, in the computer you might have uh, muted audio settings. Yeah. Audio setting. Anyway, I think um, uh, because we have uh, paucity of time, when Mr. Professor Tandon is trying to get his, you know, audio, let us take few questions from the uh, participants. Tandon Sahib, are you are you able to? No. Okay. Okay. Actually, we have uh, you know number of questions about 40, 45, 46 questions. I don't think we will be able to take all of them, but uh, I don't know whether there is any possibility of uh, you know downloading uh, these. Tandon Sahib. Yes. Uh, ah, can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes. Yes. We are able to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Please. The host had muted me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what it says. Sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. So, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. From many points of view, uh, structural engineers in general don't know much about the interaction of wind with uh, long span structures. I think the structural engineers' uh, knowledge about wind effects on structures is limited to perhaps the static effects. And when there is a simple uh, kind of a section and a, and a tower-like structures, you have got like a chimney or a tall building, you can find out the, the, uh, the uh, vortex uh, effects uh, by formulae which are given in the code. And other than that, I mean, you and you just make sure that your what critical vortex shedding frequency is less uh, is more than whatever can occur at that site so this is what structural engineers generally uh, are aware of but your presentation today has helped us to navigate through these i can only call it mumbo jumbo because that's the because of the paucity of knowledge that we possess we can uh, it's very difficult to understand this but you have illustrated it so beautifully and i am very grateful for that second thing i want to mention that one of the important slides that you showed was what is are the minimum things that you have to do for uh, uh, finding out the dynamic effects of wind. We are living in a place, in, a, in, a, in an era where, except for very uh, special or unusual kind of uh, uh, bridge, everything comes under what is called the EPC contract, which means that the contract is awarded, the contractor already has a designer, and on day one he has to start Nobody understands that you have to do uh, wind tunnel studies, etc. You have to uh, hit the ground running, as the Americans say. <laughs> so the in this uh, situation, this slide of yours, which you have now also uh, put on the screen, I think is most valuable. Most of the tenders that I have seen, whenever you come across a cable bridge, they say that wind tunnel studies are essential. Nobody understands which wind tunnel studies are we talking about. So yeah. whatever you have put on this slide, I think gives us a very good idea what are the wind tunnel studies that you have to do. Yes. And incidentally, we make no distinction between cable state bridges and extra dose bridges. Extra dose bridges are very unlikely to have any problems regarding dynamic response to win, whereas mm -hmm. the cable state bridges definitely, because of their form, their slenderness, yes. have uh, a, a bigger problem. So these type of things, I think that I wish you had covered that 
what are the cable uh, bridges that really need attention yes the i have a couple of two or three questions if i may ask what is the size of wind tunnel that you have in india uh, because as you know if you want to make something which is at a scale of 1 is to 50 yes we should know uh, what is the biggest uh, size of the model or whatever that can be put there yeah See, if you would look at uh, really 1 is to 50 also yeah. if you have a a um, let us say a um, um, railing which is yeah. 1 meter high it will be represented by half a centimeter yes so uh, <laughs> in that you can hardly put any details then we know that even railings have such an enormous effect yeah. on uh, wind tunnel uh, uh, on 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 uh, wind response the other thing that you showed which is very interesting was that when do we have to do dynamic effects when mm -hmm. does this have to be studied i think you showed one or two slides if i remember correctly in the old days we had uh, the british code which uh, gave some value. Uh, I think the slide before this, if I am, or even before this, I think, where you have given a formula. Uh, yeah, this is it. You see, if this uh, type of a thing is the first thing that structural engineers should do to find out whether dynamic effects are even important or not important. Mm -hmm. And this is another. Uh, very valuable piece of information which you have given. I don't know whether this is the same as the British code or it is different. No, no, no it is different. This, no, is no. Our, this is our own product came out of our. Oh, this is your own product. Then you better write a paper on the subject so no, that already, we. How many papers are there? <laughs> we, so <laughs> that we can put it in the code because the first thing is always whether you have to do any wind tunnel studies or other dynamic effects or not. Yeah. Yeah. So, to determine that, yes or no, pass or fail, this is the these are the type of tests we must do. Yeah. So, uh, I think you have brought out very well about the CFT and uh, yes. the, uh, the wind tunnel, the comparison of the two, and uh, Professor Prem Krishna has also mentioned about the years uh, that each of these... Um, uh, techniques have had yes. yeah. time to mature. So yeah. I'm sure CFD is the future, but at the moment, apart from the uh, accuracies that you can get, uh, there is a, another problem of if you want to do it uh, rigorously, then the amount of time and money that is required is something enormous. It may oh. far exceed what you are spending on the wind tunnel. Exactly. So it's a, if you want to do something very basic, yeah, sure. Yeah. But the modern uh, uh, approach, as I understand, is to have a combination of the two. And I think you have brought it in out in the, for example, in the buffeting analysis. It's really... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are doing a, a CFD in that, or or yeah, even a two analysis. These type is, of things, I think, are of uh, great significance. Yes. So, uh, thank you very much. That's all yeah. the comments that I had, and uh, I look uh, forward to a further. Uh, this is yes. only chapter one, uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar. Yes. I think we need to, us structural engineers, le le need to learn much more yes. than what has been presented today yeah. but thank you so much yeah no problem i'll uh, quickly go through your comments the time domain that you address that is not cfd that is not cfd that is a stochastic okay. analysis it's purely stochastic analysis because cfd is you're simulating the flow and etc here we are simulating the wind time series stochastically stochastic process and then all the time domain analysis everything is stochastic in stochastic domain and as far as CFD, I'm not commenting too much. All I can say is that I am following CFD very closely. And recently I was reading NASA. 
NASA's report on where they are on the safety side in terms of aeronautics. What they are saying, uh, they have, in certain cases, they may avoid wind tunnel tests by the year 2035. So I don't have to say much more than that. I don't want to. So you can, the rest of it, you can think of it. Then with regard to your question on scaling, uh, one is to 50, if you do it in Trivandrum, you can simulate about 120 meters of the bridge section model, 120 meters. You said some problems with railing. Uh, we are already aware of it. We know how to take care of that because you have to have equivalent porosity, okay? Equivalent porosity, the same issue will come even in cables. Cables, the stiffness is created by some uh, pianos, piano wire and et cetera, but you need the dumbbells in between to create the drag appropriately. So the same issue will come on the on the fence as well, but we have been doing this. We know how to take care of it, so there is no issue. But you can't simulate exactly equal to what is at full scale, which you are right. But we have another way of taking care of it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Suresh, and thank you, Professor Alok, can Kandal. I add, can I add one point? Suresh, yeah, sure. showed us a graph of WT after the WT, the Struton number, the WT. Oh, you showed us what graph from 44 uh, studies or 44 bridges that you have yes, studied. Yes. How yeah. truthfully represent, how truly representative could it be? Could we adopt that? What is your point on, uh, yeah, after the next one? Next one, yeah. Now, where tests are required, where tests are not required based on span. How, uh, this is a, it's a you know, statistical representation of your studies. Yes. Could we adopt this in our code to say when it is required and when it is not required? See, this equation, this equation is tabled out to uh, in states already, Correct. Uh, though it is not in the code. This study has been done about at least, I would say, Correct. probably eight years back or something by some of our gurus from uh, Canada. Right. And then this particular other symbol indications are also there because there are a number of indications in various so, codes. These we will put to, in our codes. Yeah. Yeah. So you can say roughly 50 to 60 in foot bridges, highway bridges above 100. We, we are not clearly saying that, okay, in these cases, you have to go and do a wind tunnel test. We are not saying that. All we are saying is that your attention should be there and you need to at least do an assessment with a wind expert and let him say that whether this will get into any kind of trouble or not. And if he says that, okay, this is not having a problem, uh, then avoid wind tunnel study, go through 3D buffeting and finish with that. So That's what right. that means is just go back to my initial stuff uh, because that is what we need to understand. Uh, just one, one more minute here. So you can go through wind climate, go through desktop. And if the desktop is saying that uh, this is no. good enough, everything is fine, you skip the next part and then you straight away go into buffeting. Right. You are done. But if the desktop is saying, okay, there is something that we need to figure out, and then you go for sectional, and then you go do the property. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I, I just want yeah. to tell you that just to add that uh, point that, uh, you know, you've shown us that it's a fundamental tool. I mean, wind tunnel testing is a fundamental tool. Yes. And that, uh, you know, uh, it has the capability to shed light on the underlying mechanisms. Yes. Or yes. wind-induced forces. Wind-induced forces. We are talking about. Right. Okay. And also to ensure safe and cost-effective design. Yes. Yes. You no. Know, and uh, reducing the uncertainty in wind loads. I mean, this is what we are talking about, which is what you demonstrated in this initial first right. lecture. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Harsha, thank you. and thank you, Dr. Suresh. And now I will take up questions. You see, there are uh, more than forty-nine questions, and. Uh, we, 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 will download, we will download those questions and many of them we will answer through emails. Yeah, yeah. I think that email. would Definitely be best. Definitely we will do that. Yeah. I'm sorry that this extended out. I never thought that uh, we need more time uh, than two hours. But, but uh, I think yeah, one well, common question that I am getting number of, uh, you know, places, not, okay. not technical, but, uh, yes. you know, questions regarding whether this uh, webinar is recorded, those records will be available. Yes, it, be, it is recorded. Yes. It hard be copy, available. hard copy of the handouts. Can it be given oh, to the participants? That is tricky. No hard copy of the handouts, but the okay. webinar will be recorded, 
and it will be available in YouTube. You can go back and check out all of these numbers. You can understand what it is. And so there's okay. no issue with that. Wonderful. Because okay. the handout is, I had to get permission from various people, which I will never get it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So okay. now let me take a few questions. Yes. Uh, one is by Mr. Sandeep Patiwar. He oh, is asking, Sandeep. what is bluff section and is there any mathematical expression? Okay. Bluff section. Uh, I had to go back to the bird and their farm. It's kind of tricky to say bluff means, I mean, typically square and uh, rectangles are bluff sections, right? Square, uh, rectangle, okay. head section, and uh, with a large girder, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, in bridges, most of the sections are getting bluffer. The only advantage we are getting in bridges sometimes you sometimes you open up the crash barrier uh, with a steel barrier or something then you make it open then you have a sleek uh, section or something then the vortices will get attached to the top surface and bottom surface or something like the cfd that i showed in such cases you don't get too much vertical oscillation so that is more like getting towards streamline section okay getting towards streamline section you can see how far away we are on that by just by looking, being of an airplane with the Golden Gate Bridge section. Because Golden Gate Bridge, why I'm showing that is, even though the, the depth is there, but you have lots of holes. Uh, the wind can pass through this uh, truss section, right? So normally one would think that, okay, the, uh, this, is, this is not a streamlined section, obviously, but you would uh, think that your CD is going to be lower, <laughs> but it is not because the wind is going to be seeing all kinds of members and it is affecting those members. And as a result of that, you are getting a total drag coefficient, which is 1.3. As you know, 1.3 is nothing but a drag coefficient for a square. Square is 1.3. Actually, we are getting similar to a square, even though the section is uh, more like 27 meters long and uh, the depth, I don't remember completely, but about uh, six meters or something like that. Okay, so bluff, Typically, sections are bluff, and you can see if it is not bluff, what is going to cause? I mean, look at the flow around the bird as well as the airfoil. It is getting attached, basically. Your, your drag is getting reduced. Of course, this has nothing to do with the lift. The lift can still be in trouble because, as you know, the airfoil is one of the beautiful shape in terms of the drag, which is reducing drag a lot. But you try to take off the aircraft beyond certain angle of attack, it will come down. It will be nosing down, actually, because of the unsteadiness. And that is what is called stalling. Because never ever pilot will take off beyond a particular angle of attack. So it is not quite uh, extremely stable, I would say. But they know uh, how far they can go in terms of the angle of attack and all of those things. Uh, but in bridges, similar situation. We have, most of the time, bluff sections. Uh, we have similar weight, I would say, sometimes very, very close to the aircraft as well, which is interesting because you know the tachomenarius which collapsed is 4.5 ton per meter, which is similar to Airbus 380 weight, actually, which is approximately 5 ton per meter. So uh, clear definition of bluff is quite difficult, but all I can say is that bluff means you are going to get too many vortices on your sides and you are going to get crosswind oscillations and all. Okay, uh, next question is from Mr. Pratik Jain. Okay. And he is asking, in my limited understanding, wind tunnel tests are good for laminar flows. Can you throw some light on limitations of wind tunnel tests, if any? And in future, can CFD be able to eliminate wind tunnel tests altogether? Okay, this has been partly addressed, actually. Um, we are using already CFD and we can uh, do uh, reduce the number of tests. Okay, we can do reduce the number of tests. Uh, like he said, I mean, wind tunnel tests are not without problems, but those problems are, what can I say? You may be knowing the problem. Okay, you may be already knowing the problem. So if you know the problem, you know how to fix it. But if you don't know where the problem is, you don't know how to fix it. That is a problem that the CFD is facing. Okay, we, because certain boundary conditions, your happy flow looks nice. It is matching with your winter. 
but in other cases the, the that boundary condition is not working so you have to play with another boundary condition then you have to go back to the window every time you can't do a validation so cfd is very good in terms of reducing the number of tests that is exactly what is going on in aeronautics and probably that is what is going on in wind engineering too only to building uh, sorry only to bridges okay not in buildings in buildings you have other kinds of problems which i don't want to bring it up here and then his uh, uh, questions on how sure are we and turbulence and all of those things. not not really that is not correct laminar flow we are not simulating laminar flow we are simulating turbulent flow mm -hmm. but in sectional model with a larger scale you need to be careful about what kind of turbulence you are going to put in the tar because your model is too big okay the the, the tar is uh, designed for 1 is to 400 1 is to 300 type of scale and your model is at 1 is to 50 so that is why i wrote partial turbulence scale simulation which is a known fact which is already in the papers and that is what we should be doing we will be simulating the right high frequency fluctuation of the gas in the tunnel that means you will be putting if let us say your uh, full scale demands for 20 percent turbulence in the full scale you won't be doing test at 20 percent turbulence you'll be doing at much lesser turbulence because you don't want to beef up your spectra at that location so that is all known facts actually these are known facts so i don't have any doubt and how sure are you with the wind tunnel test? Full scale measurements. There are a number of full scale measurements have been done, even now that is going on with and without dampers and etc. So that is the proof for the wind tunnel test. All right. Okay. Can so I, I will. Can I make a comment? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, no, uh, I was going to ask. Um, yes. See, if you do a test in a laminar flow, yes, is it by and large uh, conservative? It is. To the... It is. Most of the time, yeah, ninety percent of the time, because in bridges we always do uh, not laminar flow. We call it smooth flow conditions. We do the test, yeah. uh, so that means no turbulence, no spires, no roughness in the tunnel. Why we do that is at certain situations when the bridge is over a water, uh, on a on a uh, on on a day when the wind is coming at five meter per second, you don't have much waves and things like that. It's more like a smooth flow conditions. So we do that test, and yeah. then we add on turbulence to the test to see whether it is behaving differently or not. So most of the time, the lam uh, the laminar flow or the smooth flow condition is going to give you uh, a worst case condition in comparison to turbulent flow condition. But in certain cases, you can say about 10% of the time, your laminar, uh, sorry, smooth flow and turbulent flow results are not very different. Yeah. It is within 10% or so. Actually. Okay. Right. So I, I will I will take just two more questions uh, because we are almost at the end of uh, you know. Yes. So one question is from uh, Mr. Hemal Modi, who says, "How would you demonstrate the benefits of using viscous dampers on long span bridges?" And also consider stability of cable slit versus other stiffer or heavier bridge types. Oh, dampers. Probably we'll leave that question for the next time. Okay. Because I, I don't uh, don't want to talk about dampers right okay. now and discuss dampers. Okay. What is the other question? Uh, what Another you... question is from uh, Mr. Samir Sudhar, who is asking which wind spectrum we should use for the along wind, across wind, and torsion wind spectrum definition for numerical simulation? Oh, the wind spectrum, there is only one wind spectrum we have. Actually, we have longitudinal wind spectrum. You have a number of different wind spectrum equations are available. One of the best is the von Karman equation is already there for longitudinal vibrations. You can have an equation for vertical vibration as well as uh, torsional, uh, not torsional, vertical, lateral, and longitudinal. Uh, we should not mix the wind turbulence with the motion of the bridge. The bridge will be moving uh, mostly in lateral, vertical, and torsional. But as far as the wind spectrum is concerned, we have to be bothering about a lateral two directions as well as vertical. So okay. that will be simulated. That is not an issue because there, there is also uh, correspondence between LU and LX and other directions. You know, when you get your LU 15%, the other direction will be slightly lesser and things like that. So there's lots of understanding on those uh, principles. Okay. 
one last question from uh, mr anubin joy okay how to do wind time history when to do an advantage or disadvantage of wind time history okay wind time history is done on, only at the time of 3d buffeting and in the winter run we don't need it because you are already simulating the wind so you don't need it but if you are doing analytical simulations uh, not cfd in cfd you don't need wind time uh, wind velocity simulation only when you do 3d buffeting analysis in uh, uh, using a time domain method you need wind velocity hitting your bridge at that time you had to use the stochastic simulation there are a number of models available uh, arima model arma model ari model number of models available one can use one of those equations and and mind you that these simulations are based on stochastic simulation means there is a random number generator and all of those things so each time you do a simulation you are going to see a different time history with a with the approximate properties right with respect to spectra with respect to rms and all of those things but it is not exact time history and because of that reason when you do 3d buffeting you have to have a spectrum of time histories and do the response you don't just generate one time series and then you do the analysis or done no you can't do that you have to have at least uh, i would say 15 to 20 time domain simulations to create different time histories hitting the bridge and then get the response that the uh, i mean overall response and then do the uh, the loading scenarios because there is a random number generator involved and random number generation as you know it is it, as the name says it is a random number so it could be any number so you need a pool of uh, time history to say something statistically correct well with this we come to the end of uh, this uh, great webinar and i Uh, profusely thank dr suresh kumar for such an excellent and fascinating presentation and i also thank all the panelists who have you know put lot of spices uh, to this presentation and uh, you know uh, i think it has generated lot of interest also on the subject of wind and i look forward to many more such presentations the other chapters as professor tendon puts it Uh, and we will talk to you separately for yes. other chapters of wind maybe on uh, dynamic characteristics of stay cable of the tower yes. dynamics etc thank you very much and thank thanks you, thanks to all thank the you. panelists thanks. Thanks with this everybody. with this we close uh, this webinar thank yeah. you thank you thank you all thank you thanks yeah